Hey, uh, I'm looking forward to just exploring some ideas in the Word of God today. To, to start us off, I want, I want to just start you off by thinking a certain idea. Uh, if, if you were going to look for an apprentice uh, to learn your trade, just pretend you're a, a craftsman, a musician, or somebody that has got an ability, amazing ability that you want to pass on to an apprentice, and you're looking for an apprentice, what would you be looking for? Uh, they don't necessarily have to have the skills because you're going to teach them. They don't necessarily have to, you know, be amazing or even have their life in order because they're going to grow up and you'll get them there. So what, what really are you looking for when you're looking for an apprentice? You're looking for somebody that ultimately will learn to do what you do, right? You're looking for somebody that will produce the fruit of electricity if you're an electrician. You're looking for somebody who will put the, produce the fruit of music if you're a musician. They, you ultimately want somebody that if you invest the time and training in them, that they will ultimately produce the fruit of that. Is that not right? Now, to switch it around, if, if, you were a, 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 if you were an apprentice looking for a master to train you, to teach you so that you can ultimately become successful in a certain thing, you are looking for somebody that can produce the fruit of that, right? Like, you're not just looking for anybody. You're not going to go to a plumber if you want to become a master electrician because you won't produce the fruit that you desire in the end. And, and today we want to talk about how in the life that you ordered that we are looking for someone that can help us in order to be fruitful. We, we are looking for somebody that can take us on a journey that can give us the help that we need, the guidance that we need, the training that we need, the development that we need, the patience that we need so that we can ultimately become fruitful. Is that right? right? And so I want to talk today and recommend to you a certain person that could possibly potentially be your master if you choose to follow him. And I want to talk about it in recommending him in certain ways. Number one, first thing you really want is you want somebody that really believes in you. In Matthew chapter 6, 5, verses 13 to 16, just as Jesus is launching his wouldn't it be great if message of the Sermon on the Mount, he talks about all of this blessedness that, he, that people can walk in if they have the right attitude towards God. And then he starts talking about the potential of people, and he says this, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt lust has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. In Canada, we put it on roads to melt the snow. And then, of course, it rots your car, but that's a different story. And then he goes on. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in, in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. One of this, this, this sermon and this idea, I think, is amazing because I think that a lot of people don't know this about Jesus. And that is that Jesus believes in people. It, 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 we, are, we don't follow a Christ who's like, what's the matter with you? Get your life right. You're a useless piece of worthless trash. You know, I can barely save you on the cross. And then after that, what good are you? He's not like that at all. In fact, he starts out saying, I'm actually the only one who does believe in you. I'm the one that sees you in your true potential. You are like salt and light. I mean, and to the people of that world, they are talking about two vital things, you know, before electricity. If there's no light, does anything happen? Is anybody fruitful at night? Do things grow? Like it says, there's, without the sun shining, without opportunity to work, there's no fruit. He says, you're that. You're that. And then he says, you're salt. Like it's a preserving, life restoring, making sure there's food in the future, making sure food has taste, making sure that your world is full of great taste and great light. And I, I just think it's fantastic. Jesus Christ... Your potential master is saying, you are amazing. You are, oh, you're made in God's image. I know that you're covered in filth and I know that it's all work, like broken and it's not working, but I see what God put there originally. I see it. You could be shining in his goodness. And I just like this sermon delivered to 5,000 people on the side of a hill not filled with scholars and religious leaders and amazing generals and you know, gifted philosophers. It's filled with moms and dads and kids and criminals and broken people and religious nuts and zealots and, and weirdos and regular people who can hardly keep their lives together at the moment. And he's up there saying, you are salt and light. I love it. He believes in us. 
But remember that Jesus is also the one that responds to us when we go, okay, let's do it. That he's the one who warns us that it's harder than we think. He's the one who tells us, unsalty salts. You are at the current state, without his help, an unsalty salt. Not much fun. Not much good. And you are a hidden light. And that there is reasons why you have become unsalty and hidden. And he's the one who knows that. He's the one who tells you up front at the truth. When you say, Jesus, I'd love to, you, you sound like you believe in me. I'll go your way. I'll take your hand. He's the one who says, uh, hang on a second. You realize there's going to be a whole lot of work to do here. That we've got to become something else because at the moment you're not there. I love this testimony from the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul lived the life of a Pharisee. And, and a Pharisee means that he was a very religious person, but very, very strict. If, if there's any group of people who tried hard to be good, tried hard to be salt, tried hard to be light, it's the Apostle Paul and his Pharisee team. These guys lived a very, very strict code. We're having current issues with this. I don't know if that helped anything, but it made you feel better. <laughs> The Apostle Paul writes about his own struggle to become salt and light in this way. He says, I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what's right, but not the ability to carry it out. Because I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Well, now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find there'd be a law that when I want to do what's right, evil lies close at hand. Now, many people, as they're listening to that, are kind of going, identifying. You're going, why is that? That's interesting. Here's this great teacher who's tried his life to be good, and he's going, oh, hang on a second. I try to do good, and then I don't. Why? That doesn't make sense to me. And then he reveals in the passage that there's laws at work. Laws that must be over... Okay, we're switching up. How you doing? There we go. There's, <clears throat> sorry, there's laws at work. Laws that must be overcome by somebody who's greater than those laws. Somebody who can rewrite the legal code that guards and governs your life. So he's, he's going to do something. But Paul is revealing that even though he tried his hardest, he could not be the good person that he wanted to be. Now, if you're wondering what this passage means, uh, I have an in deep coming out, I think this week on Wednesday, that explains this and talks about how dying with Christ sets us free from those laws that govern us. But we can't go into depth here, but please watch online. You'll love it. But Jesus talks about this. In Matthew chapter 7, you know, a couple of chapters on from his dream vision of salt and light, he says, Whatever you wish, to, you know, so whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Jesus compels us with this idea of you can be an amazing, world changing person, and you just need to think about not just what you want, but what other people would want you to do for them. And if you use that as a governing principle in your life, you will always end up fulfilling the law. You will always end up doing what the commands teach and you will ultimately live the good life. But listen to the verses that come after it. He says this, enter the narrow gate for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. And, and I think this is, this is a fundamental difference in the teaching of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ does not teach religious principles and methods. Jesus Christ enables us to become righteous by faith and then to live by the power of his spirit to live a life that brings glory to God. We reveal, we witness for him by the power of his spirit. We don't do it by ourselves. We must have him because he's the one who warns us. It's actually harder than you think. That way is far narrower and far more difficult than you were imagining it to be. And the way that ends up with everything goes wrong is so easy to get on and it's so easy to fall into. But he uses these two ideas, the way and the gate. The way is, it's, 
It can be wide and easy or it can be narrow and difficult. And the gate can be wide and easy or it can be narrow and difficult. And there are always two things that are happening. I spoke about this uh, about a month ago and maybe you watched the sermon online about how there is a giant difference between the gate, the initial choice to do something, and then the long journey of actually doing it. You know, like uh, I did a wedding like a week and a half ago. That's a gate. There's a whole long way ahead of them. Do you understand what I'm saying? Right? And I, when I was looking at the two people walking through the gate, I'm like, Jesus, go with you. Right? Because there's going to be a long way. And you're going to need a moderator who's in there telling you both your jerks. So, <laughs> no, I'm sorry. He's polite about it. But he's like, come on. Crow up, everyone. The way in the gate. And so, here's the truth. The gate is the moment when you choose Jesus to be your savior. He comes to help you. In, I love here in John 14, he says, if you love me, like if you respond to me, you will keep my commandments. And I'm gonna ask the Father and he's gonna give you another helper to be with you forever. I, I, I love this. The, the moment when we say to Jesus, I see what you're saying, and I recognize now that I need a savior. Like I'm not, gonna, I'm not good enough to qualify for heaven. I'm not good enough to please the Father. If it, were, if it were up to a judge, I would deserve condemnation. But Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross so that I could have salvation, so that I could be purchased, then what I had done could be removed, and then I could be given something I didn't deserve. That when you do that, he doesn't just kind of go, great, welcome to the club, but no, he sends his own spirit to be your helper, to live within you, so that you can ultimately walk in the way that he says. Because that's how, if you love him, then you'll obey your commands. But if you don't love him, you'll never walk in his commands. If you don't have him, you can't follow him. But he said, don't worry, my Holy Spirit's going to come and he's going to help you, transform you, change you, and you're going to get help in my salvation. But second to that is we also have to choose to walk his way. And he also has to come and help us. You see, he, he requires a control in our lives in order to help us become the people that, we, that he sees in us. People talk about salvation and lordship. You know, Jesus, your savior, or Jesus, your Lord as though you could choose one and not choose the other. But I can tell you this, because the gate, you know, is the thing that's everybody's on everybody's mind. I want to be saved. I want to get in the gate of heaven. I want to get in the gate of forgiveness. Gate becomes all important. But you need to have the Lord lead you in the way. And if he's not Lord to you, then there's no way that you're ultimately going to be shaped by him to live the righteous life that he's called you to live. Does that make sense? Right? It's pretty, pretty logical, right? Jesus is not talking about anything. I mean, if you hired an apprentice and that apprentice wouldn't do anything that you wanted them to do, would you keep them? I mean, you might just for mercy's sake. And that's what the scriptures actually say, that some people are saved by the skin of their teeth, Paul says, which is where we get that expression from. Like some people just get in, but they didn't get there doing any good. They kind of blew up the whole thing. But if you trust Christ as Lord, then ultimately you can walk in his way. Now, I want to talk about why he recommends, recommends himself in this way. Matthew chapter 11, verses 29 to 30, he says this. Take my yoke. That's a part of the egg. <laughs> it's, sorry, I just in case you were wondering. It's not, by the way, because if you take his yoke upon you, then the yoke's on you. So, no. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, a lot of what I'm going to say this year is based off these, these, this word, this Greek word, Christos, Christos, which means easy. We're, we translate it easy, but it means a lot more than that. It means what is useful, what is, what is recommended to give a go at. If, you, if there's any way to try, this is the way you should try because this is the way that works. Like it'll turn out for you. It's, it's better, it's easy, it's good, it's gracious, it's, it's kind. It's a kindness because how many people have ever done something wrong and then you just have to do it again, 
right? And it happens a lot, right? Done that in relationships? That's hard when you keep doing the same wrong thing and you end up having to repeat the same cycle again and again and again. You know what a mercy is? A mercy and a grace is when somebody says, don't do that anymore. Try this. I want to save you 20 years. Here's a better way. You see, that's what Jesus says. If you take on my yoke, if, you, if you're yoked to me, then ultimately your life ends up easier because you don't have to do things twice. You don't have to do it frustratingly again and again and wonder, why is this going on? Because he's better than that. And what he wants to lead us in is into a good way. He's saying, my yoke is better. My yoke is easier. My yoke is goodness. My yoke is gracious. And my yoke is kind. We follow him because his way is better. Better for everybody. If we're yoked to him. Now, what is a yoke? Okay, so let's just look at a little few things here. A yoke is what Jesus is referring to is this sort of two buckled harness where you would, in a sense, lock the neck of one animal to the neck of another animal so that you could get two animals pulling in the same direction for the purpose of, say, plowing or pulling a wagon or something. The only way that you can get two to pull equally is if you yoke them together. Does that make sense? Like you strap it around your neck and you strap it around the other person's neck. Now, for people, it doesn't work so well because we're not great at pulling plows. But for animals, this is it, right? You want to train. Now, what they would do in the ancient days is if you've got a young bull, young ox, young donkey, young horse, and they don't know anything about pulling anything, that you yoke them with an old one. Like somebody who knows how, how this is going to go. And the yoke around the neck of one of the, you know, the old bull. As soon as that, that bull hears the little whatever, giddy up, or whatever they said in the ancient of days, and starts going, what happens to the neck of the other animal if it does not also start going? It's an excruciating pain. It's like, oh, I can't breathe. So you learn to walk. Now, what if that young animal also likes to sprint ahead? <laughs> See, the yoking is a way to train somebody else in order to live a certain way. And it's, let me just say this, for the audience of this day, it was humiliating. It was humiliating. In fact, the Romans had a saying that if a soldier ever won under the yoke, that they would lose their, even their titles in their community. So imagine a Roman soldier fought a battle and lost. The only way to get out of the battle and save your life is to surrender and go under the yoke of your enemy. And then they let you go home. When you got home, you were treated like you weren't even a human. Sometimes they would lose their marriages because the marriage contract would be broken by that yoking. They would lose their houses, they'd lose their possessions, they'd lose their dignity. And that's why soldiers just learn fight to the death because what life have you got? And so when Jesus is saying this, he's saying it quite bluntly. It is humiliating to have to learn from somebody else. He knows it. And if you have to get to that place in your life where you are that broken, like I was, figured I couldn't do this anymore. And it's more humiliating for me to keep trying than for me to go under the yoke of somebody else. I will choose Jesus. Now, Jesus makes this choice phenomenally easier. See, he's talking about releasing us, not burdening us. He's not taking, talking about taking our dignity. He's talking about giving us dignity. He's not talking to make up demands of us. He's talking about giving a gift to us. So he says this in Matthew 11, just before that passage, he says, all things have been handed over to me by my father. And no one knows the son except the father. No one knows the father except the son. And, and anyone to whom the son chooses to reveal him. And then he says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now, he, he uses these words very particularly. You are heavy. This is a load that you're carrying that you cannot manage. You cannot get this job done. You every single day, I don't, this is one of the things that I think people don't realize, that, that condemnation and shame is everywhere. And people are doing all kinds of religious things to make themselves feel better about themselves, but ultimately deep down you realize that you just don't make it. 
And I don't even care what your religion is. Your religion could be environmentalism, but you will know that you're never environmental enough. You're just not good enough. You never went all of the way. And if it's moralism, well, you're never good enough. And if it's purity, well, you're never pure enough. And if it's about effort and achievement, you never make enough. You never do enough. And that is a life that a human cannot endure. It is the burden. And Christ says, I want you to come to me because my purpose is to get that burden off of you. And he talks about the people in the world. Now, the people in their world that, were, that Jesus used this word burden for were the religious leaders who were making demands of people. And in fact, he says to them, woe to you Pharisees, because you love the best seat in a synagogue, the greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you, because you're like an unmarked grave. People walk over them without knowing it. One of the lawyers answered him, hey, teacher, in saying these things, you insult us also. <clears throat> Jesus, you're being impolite. How rude. And Jesus says, woe to you lawyers also, because you load up burdens hard to bear and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Oh, there's just something so wonderful about Jesus when he kind of clears the deck, isn't there? He's like a bunch of pretenders. You think that you're making the world better by coming up with lofty ideas on how good can people can be? You should do this. You should do that. You should be like this. Your life should come out like that. It sounds exactly like the voice in your head. Constantly telling you that you should be better. But does that voice in your head ever lift a finger to help you? Does it? The one that says you can't do this, why do you keep screwing up? You should be better than you are. Come on, try harder, be a better person. It must be your fault. That voice is lying and putting a burden on you. And Jesus says, just come to me. You know, you got a voice, I got a voice. My spirit can speak to you, telling you who you don't even know you are and can lead you and guide you. Let me lift your burden. You see, we ultimately end up surrendering to the gentleman, not the taskmaster. Now, this is really vital. In Matthew chapter 11, like we, he says, take my yoke upon you, learn from me, because I am gentle and I'm lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. But notice how he recommends himself because he is gentle and lowly. Gentle and lowly. Because being able to really learn from somebody means that that person must be in a close, trusting relationship with you, that you trust them with your most deepest secrets and your deepest needs. Because we're talking about somebody who shapes us. And if that person is domineering and, and just says, that's not good enough, try harder, and is abusive and is inconsiderate to the weaknesses that you have, you will not be able to ultimately learn from them. And so... This, this idea of gentleness, uh, I'm writing a chapter in a book right now, not to do with this sermon, but because I was doing research on the concept of gentleness in the book that I'm writing, which is not to do with what I'm saying right now, which is a loop that I'm stuck in. Uh, um, the word gentleness in scripture is always used in the context of learning. It's, it's always in the sense, the kind of the, the attitude of the teacher, the attitude of the instructor, or if you're going to get into an argument and you think you're going to tell somebody how it's going to be, you will always lose that argument because that person will not change. It says a gentle tongue is a tree of life, but a perverseness, which means like a twisting, like as though there's an ulterior motive. But it, if perverseness is in it, it breaks the spirit. A fool despises his father's instruction, but whoever heeds reproof is prudent. I'll give you another one. 1 Peter 3.15. But in your hearts, honor Christ as Lord, the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that's in you. Yet, 
Do it with gentleness and respect. I'll give you another one. 2 Timothy 2, 24, 25. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. And this is my favorite one. In Psalm 18, 34 to 36, he trains my hands for war so that my arm can bend a bow of bronze. You have given me the shield of your salvation and your right hand supported me and your gentleness made me great. You gave a wide place for my steps under me and my feet did not slip. David had many, many teachers. None was like God the Father. Because only God the Father's compassionate gentleness actually was able to shape him. Because what ultimately you want is you, the master does not want somebody putting on a show but he wants somebody who's learned to love his own values, learned to cherish the same things. And the only way that happens is for that teacher to become very gentle with you. Because you have to feel like this person really cares about me and isn't going to reject me just because I got it wrong. They're going to they're gonna be with me in the hard times. They're going to be with me when I fail. They're going to be alongside me as I learn to walk a way that I've never walked before. They're going to be compassionate to me when I just don't get it. One time I was, uh, I was uh, learning uh, building work. Uh, when I was in Bible college, I had lots of jobs. One of the jobs was I worked on a bu in building construction. We framed houses. And the walls had been put up, and they were putting the roof on. And this, uh, the guy, the guy that was the builder, there was lots of builders and I was just the lowly, well, I wasn't really even an apprentice. I was just there, you know, carrying stuff. And the guy that was up on the roof, he didn't want to obviously come down to do this task. So he shouted out to me, bring me the ridge. And he shook, bring me the ridge piece. I didn't know anything. So I'm like walking around going, hey, you know, I got nothing here. <laughs> and I would just, I'd, I'd pick up a piece of timber and bring it to him like this, huh? <laughs> and he'd go, no, that's not a ridge. That's a, you know, that's a beam. Huh? Man, I go for myself, bring it back. <laughs> like it was a favorable moment in my life. After about four or five times of bringing the wrong thing to him, I lifted up this piece to him and he goes, yeah, that's it. And then he looks around at the other guys and he goes, Look at him. He's so cute. Because <laughs> all I was doing is trying to get it right. But I've been on lots of building sites where that's not the response. You're all going, yeah, 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 yeah. You idiot! What's the matter with you? You moron! You see... What helped me to learn was I wanted to, I wanted to be like them. I wanted to learn what they learned. I valued them as people and I was willing to go the journey and they helped me by being gentle with me. But let me, let me tell you this. You will never be the potential that you were made to be unless Jesus guides you there. Now, the reason that currently he's not guiding you as effectively is because you don't trust him very much. Now, he's okay. Not like, going, don't trust me, I'm out of here. No, he's like, I know, it's hard for you to trust me because you think that if you have to lean on me or be guided by me, then that makes you less. But Jesus is saying, that is just not true with me. Because when you don't get it, I just go, oh, isn't she so cute? <laughs> Look at her making a mess of that relationship. So cute. She's a trying to trust. You. You, you need, 
you need an absolute certainty that Christ Jesus, if you, if you yoke to him, that he's going to make your life ordered. He's never going to hurt you. He's going to save you time and money and suffering and pain. But he's not going to steal your dignity as you grow. Because by his gentleness, he will make you great. Not by his dominion, he will make you small. By his gentle leading in your life, he's going to make you an amazing person that other people will love and respect because you will ultimately be walking in that way of loving your neighbor as yourself and doing unto others as you would have them do unto you and caring and shining and salting the world. But you have to trust him. And I want to tell you this. You can trust Jesus Christ. He is the only one who will get you where you want to go. So, Father, as we spend a bit of time now just contemplating you in worship, and thinking about how good you are and faithful you are to us. We pray that you give that spirit to us that yields willingly to you. Lord, I know that in your word, your servant David, he prayed this prayer where he said, Lord, give me a willing spirit. And my prayer is that for all of us here today and those watching online, and that you would... Help us to have a spirit that wills ourselves under you and allows your guiding and your leading and your, your direction in our lives in ways that we've never done before. Lord, that you would help us to totally trust you because you are gentle and good and kind. Lord, I pray that as we reflect on you now and worship, that you would give us that spirit of surrender we just let go and say, okay, God, take me, use me, lead me, shape me. I trust you and I want to honor you. So Father, let that spirit arise in us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you want more videos like the one you've just seen, you know what? Click on the link below. And if you want to subscribe to our YouTube channel, also click on the link below because I can tell you what, there's some brilliant stuff there. We'll catch you again soon. Cheers.